robotic section. So um, in the software engineering uh, section, we are focusing on uh, bringing out uh, different software technologies. Uh, so this could be working with data. It could be adding software-based intelligence to projects and processes, and then also building technology uh, to support human trust in digital technology and prove how efficient we, we can develop uh, software. So we are 28 people working in different uh, areas to address uh, these needs. So some of the different topics that we touch on is uh, modeling and simulation from data. It is working with semantic spatial data, security, how do we verify systems? How do you develop software technology with a lot of AI machine learning components? It is how do you develop modular software systems? It is how to run the software uh, development processes and putting this into uh, practice. So, um, a lot of the work uh, we're going to be talking about uh, is centered in our uh, Industry 4.0 lab, uh, where we're coming together from software, robotics, operation management uh, to work on uh, how do we develop uh, the next generation of automation solutions, bringing in different technologies from the collaborative robots, uh, different types of sensors, edge computing, uh, also wideband positioning, different forms of, of interaction, augmented reality, and so on. And there's a lot of different uh, opportunities uh, we are exploring here uh, in, a, in a collaborative space across uh, the different disciplines. So uh, some of the topics that we work on uh, from the software engineering side is that uh, we, in terms of, of bringing out automation uh, to many more companies, and also to many more people, uh, we need to uh, make it easy for them to program them. Uh, so in one of our projects, we are working on uh, making a new uh, robot solution for facility management, so uh, cleaning and clearing tables. And there we, we are working on how do we enable kind of low code programming for uh, the cleaning personnel so they can instruct uh, the robots uh, for uh, doing the task they want. Uh, so this is one of the topics we explore. And then uh, how do you link uh, the, the low-code programming of blocks uh, is the examples uh, given here uh, to uh, the more intelligent part and the, the, the robotic solutions. Uh, another topic we're working on is edge computing. So uh, from a software engineering point of view, uh, with collecting much more data from the robots and also applying much more uh, AI models, um, we need to figure out uh, where do we run these uh, in the future. Uh, and of course, we can increase uh, the computing capacity of, of each uh, robot or robotic cell, uh, but there might also be opportunities of kind of looking across uh, different robots. Can we share the computing power uh, across them? And also, uh, in a lot of automation solution settings, uh, there is a need for uh, securing privacy, reliability, confidentiality of data, low latency, which means that the cloud is not always uh, the solution. So here we're looking into what type of software technologies enable us to deploy machine learning across a distributed set of uh, computing nodes. Um, and then when we are collecting uh, data, we need uh, to be able to describe what data it is, where do they come from, uh, how do they relate to each other. So here we are working with semantic uh, technologies to annotate uh, the data um, so we can query the data. Uh, so ask, I would like data from this uh, cell uh, or these cells, I would like data covering these aspects or this location. Uh, so this is some of the things where we are looking at how can we enable it to be easier to reuse uh, robotic data uh, for machine learning. We already did uh, some work. Uh, we have been part of this work to create Brick, which is really a, a way of uh, describing data from buildings. And a lot of uh, robotic data is relating to the building context. Um, so, so that's uh, one of the technologies that we build upon in, in this work. Uh, and then we are also uh, looking into how do we reconfigure um, automation solutions. So given that today we have kind of deployed one solution, maybe tomorrow we need to change it. So how do we make uh, the software part of robotic solution reconfigurable uh, so uh, we can change it over time as new uh, needs appear? 
Uh, and then also from the perspective of uh, the users uh, to widen uh, the people that can engage into a robotic solution, uh, we're looking into how can we make it easy to uh, interact with the robotic solution. So looking into what is the role of augmented reality? How can we deploy it? Uh, should it be a mobile version? Should it be a headset version? Uh, what um, uh, brings out the most features to people and make it easier for them uh, to program it. So um, if we take the large picture from a software engineering point of view, uh, what we have um, when we kind of approach the robotic field, what we can see is there's a lot of different applications that needs to run. Uh, so spanning from task scheduling, post estimation, trajectory learning, fleet management, if we go to uh, mobile robots, uh, navigation, uh, predictive maintenance, quality assurance of, of what is produced. And uh, then we need to figure out how do we execute uh, these uh, different software applications. And we also need to provide the processing power, the data storage, and the communication uh, to tie these uh, together. And one of the projects where we are looking into this is this project on edge-based AI system for predictive maintenance where we, uh, in collaboration with different universities in Denmark, is looking into how do we make a different elements of the automation uh, system uh, more uh, able to predict what maintenance uh, needs are, are there so we can uh, optimize that early uh, to have uh, an increase in efficiency. And there we are, for instance, uh, in a case together with Universal Robots, looking into what does this mean uh, for a collaborative robot? Uh, how can we uh, optimize uh, uh, the maintenance over time in the long perspective so uh, um, automation solutions become more reliable, more stable, uh, and, and work better? Uh, and here we are then, in terms of uh, doing this, we need to collect data over time, we need to run some models that can predict uh, various elements of the performance. And uh, that's where we are looking into how can we kind of move this computation uh, to the edge? Because of course you could send it to the cloud, um, but there's a lot of different kind of uh, industrial organizations that are not too happy of, of connecting uh, their industrial facilities uh, to the cloud. Um, uh, and also uh, for the, some of this, we would like to store the, the data locally, uh, also for confidentiality uh, reasons. So that's why we look into a local edge uh, computing. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we apply then our uh, kind of background in software engineering, where we would like to engineer the software part of the system. So we provide the valuable functionality to the users, but, but we also try to optimize uh, the, the, the quality requirements for the system. And if we took a simple example like performance, so if we have a system where we are sending out a lot of events and that is overflowing the system, uh, we might put in a queue uh, to optimize the behavior of that system. And that's kind of how we work uh, with the software engineering that we put in kind of general tactics to optimize the quality. And then we look for uh, what kind of software technologies can we put in uh, to address these needs. And uh, in terms of these qualities that we look towards, uh, we look at it from many different perspectives. So one is interoperability, uh, and that's where, for instance, these semantic technologies come in uh, to enable that, that system can interchange data. There is energy efficiency, uh, which is both relevant on a kind of large scale for uh, the climate effects, but then also if we have a battery powered uh, uh, robots, uh, this is also important. We have privacy protection for the cases where we have uh, people around uh, the uh, robots uh, where we need to look into what data do we collect and how do we share it. And then also resource adaptability. So depending on the type of setting where we deploy our software, we will have different resources, we will have different sensors with different qualities and different uh, abilities uh, to automate uh, different behaviors. So um, if we go back to this scenario here now of, of deploying uh, the different um, types of applications uh, with this kind of idea of edge computing, what we try to do here on an architectural level is to increase the amount of resources that we have available for computing by sharing the resources. 
And um, then we can start then to look at uh, these different applications have different needs in terms of both kind of what is the latency uh, that we need to um, fulfill for the different computations for the robot to be able to take the next action. Uh, and there's also different needs in terms of data storage. Uh, so th this is something that we can start to describe for the applications, what are the different uh, needs they have. And then we can then look into if we take one application, like predictive maintenance, uh, if we want to run this uh, distributed, we need to figure out how do we decompose this software application. And there's different type of technologies for doing that. So there's the recent trend of containerizing software applications. This could be one way. There's not a trend of working on kind of what are the individual functions in a piece of software and then start to distribute that. And you can also go to the very low level instructions down at the CPU uh, level and then start to distribute that. So there we are working with different software technologies uh, so if we look at the containerization level, uh, we're working with different types of doing containerization uh, that fits uh, the type of edge nodes. Uh, so there's different technologies where we are working on uh, what is the best pros and cons uh, for different types of uh, robotic applications. And of course, what we would like to do is look into, do we utilize the CPUs? Do we have the right fit for memory? What is the energy consumption? Is there a kind of a, a overhead of distributing the applications? And, and then you can also go to the function level where there's other technologies uh, like uh, Ray uh, coming out of the um, uh, Berkeley Rice Lab, for instance, that, that, that is able to distribute on a function level. So there we are kind of evaluating, looking into uh, what is the best way to decompose robotic applications and what is the best way to um, distribute them. And then uh, we do uh, evaluations uh, with different types of edge nodes to figure out what is the uh, CPU utilization you achieve with different uh, technologies, memory, and so on, uh, to be able to inform uh, the designers of robotic solutions in, in terms of how do they best utilize uh, different uh, edge resources for um, different types of applications. Good. So uh, that was uh, one of the uh, properties. Another properties we are looking into is uh, energy efficiency. And uh, Huang will take over here and tell about our work here. So in terms of energy efficiency, uh, traditionally industry focus on low cost production, regardless of energy and resource consumption. However, the United Nations saw that problem and proposed sustainable development goals. One of those is responsible consumption and production. And we think that collaborative robots or lightweight, lightweight industrial robots will play an important role uh, for, do, uh, for this activity. Because uh, lightweight robots in general have a high accuracy and high reprodu uh, reproductivity. So it means that a robot can work efficiently, reducing the energy consumption of the uh, task and also the wasting of resources. Uh, so in this case, we have two scenarios where uh, energy optimization of these robots are necessary. The first one is that if we see in a global perspective, thousands of new robots are using in the industry, in the industry. And the energy consumption of maybe one robot is not significant. Actually, it could be around 100 watts or 200 watts. But if we see that 50,000 new robots were installed, new lightweight industrial robots were installed last year, we see that small change can make a big difference. The second application is where we have a battery, for example, mobile platforms, um, mobile manipulators. In this case, energy and mold saving represents a long uh, battery time. So for doing that, the first thing that we did is we modeled the energy consumption of collaborative robots. For doing that, we propose a model that is shown in this, this slide. And we just in this model, we can model the energy consumption of any collaborative robot. We have tested this model for universal robots for Franca, and we are testing that with Dawson. After that, so we did an energy assessment based on different uh, Operation, operational factors, we modify these operational factors and see how the energy consumption of the robot uh, changes. We found different trends and that help us to optimize the energy consumption. Based on these trends, we propose uh, four techniques how to reduce the energy consumption. One is the optimal manufacturing instructions, optimal joint configurations, 
reduction of dissipative energy and optimal motion. This knowledge uh, was disseminated in the conference R22 and also in IROS. And this was uh, using an AR platform where practitioners can play a game and see how you can optimal program the robots. The current work is that we are not only analyzing uh, the energy consumption of the robot itself, we are analyzing the, of the whole robot. It means that also we are including the energy consumption of the controller. So what we want to do is to create a, a pipeline to identify uh, what elements of the robot consumes the most energy. The second thing is that also we want to create a benchmarking analysis. Using different metrics, we want to analyze which robots consume more energy than others. And at the end, what we want to create is some kind of a standard where a robot can have a layer like, you know, like a refrigerator or a TV has. In that way, all the uh, manufacturers will like to improve their, uh, their technology to achieve a higher standard. Yeah. Thanks, Juan. Um, so uh, one of our other projects uh, where we are working on uh, is, is this uh, system for uh, facility management, where we are looking into uh, how can we make a mobile manipulator that can help with cleaning and clearing uh, tables. In this project, uh, we are working also with interoperability uh, because uh, for this task, uh, the robot needs to know where to go. And uh, here we are kind of combining this uh, with IoT technology. And uh, that's particular in the building space. It's interesting to look into how do we combine uh, the, the IoT technology that is more kind of uh, low cost compared to uh, a classical uh, robotic and automation uh, designed sensors. Uh, of course, the, the quality of the sensing is also generally uh, lower, but it, it enables us to do a much more kind of wide deployment of sensors, for instance, for uh, detecting the presence of people or uh, object detection, uh, making a, a heat map here as is shown of where is people, uh, and then take that a more uh, 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 low uh, resolution data into our system. And what we're looking there uh, for is, is looking into how do we combine low quality observations from IoT sensors with uh, um, high uh, quality observations uh, from the robot. But the robot can only be uh, one place, whereas the IoT sensors we can deploy all over the place. So we are looking into how do we um, take in the IoT data, put that into our world model, then uh, use that to make decisions for uh, where, where should the robot do? And when the robot uh, uh, appears um, in, in the local area, uh, update and correct our world model. So here we're looking into the, the ways of combining data and working with the uncertainty of the different observations to um, put uh, the best uh, information uh, into our world model that will uh, drive our decision making for the system. So, uh, Another uh, quality that we are working with is uh, privacy protection. So um, in the one side here, we have a view of uh, what uh, information you can get from uh, 3D stereo vision cameras for ceiling mounting. These are uh, today installed in a lot of uh, supermarkets, department stores, and this is kind of what you can get. You can sense where people go and their height. Uh, on the other side, there is here a view from uh, a mobile robot driving around with his camera. Uh, of course, classically, uh, this data is not uh, collected, but, but it is there. And this means that we need to look at uh, what privacy challenges we have. And of course, especially when we go into service and welfare uh, robotics. So uh, on the top view, there is uh, a picture from the Smooth uh, project that we are running at SDU on um, how to uh, design uh, robots uh, for elderly. Uh, this is run by uh, SDU uh, Robotics. And then uh, we have the facility cobot project where we're looking into um, uh, facility management robot where we also drive around people. Um, uh, here in uh, Munich, there is uh, many different projects in this direction. Here is just uh, from the DLR lab, uh, some of the uh, robots um, shown 
going uh, into integration very tightly with people. And this means that the robots is going to process, collect a lot of uh, data, uh, highly identifiable. So um, in uh, the field of, of sensors and, um, and computing, there's been a number of study to figure out how do people re re kind of live with uh, monitoring of their lives? And one of the well-known experiments was the Helsinki privacy experiment that was done in 2011, where the researchers were got allowed to install very heavy monitoring of a number of people's homes. And what they uh, found out was, uh, or what they wanted to figure out is how people would react. And what they found out was that people kind of adapted and they didn't, uh, react uh, as strongly as they uh, would have expected. And other uh, research have kind of confirmed that, that, that in general, people are, are kind of uh, not that good about caring about their privacy. And some other research have shown that it's not before you start acting on the data and people really see the consequence of the data uh, that, uh, that people uh, feel that their privacy has been violated. And that means that that we need to be very carefully about how we design this uh, these technologies because the reaction uh, doesn't come when we put in the technology; it comes when something is misused. Uh, the way we approach it in software engineering is um, that we look at uh, what type of uh, misuse can happen. Um, so, is it a disclosure of data? Is it um, insecurity? That's the problem, or what happens? And then there's a number of different type of responses that you can do to address this. Uh, you can try to minimize the data you collect. You can try to hide the identity of people. You can separate the data. You can abstract it. You can control. You can inform people that you're collecting the data and that they can kind of enforce um, what data is collected and that you can validate this uh, with the, the governmental uh, representative. And But what is at the end of all of this is that we want to achieve an acceptable risk level in terms of how a privacy um, uh, sensitive data is handled uh, by uh, our systems. Uh, and this is where uh, one of uh, the tactics here that I mentioned is to separate data. And uh, in this uh, system on predictive maintenance, what we're doing here is that we would like to collect some runtime data. We, would, we are looking into how can we keep this as locally as possible so we don't share um, uh, that much uh, data with the cloud or, or other places. So this is kind of one way to do it. But um, to figure out how much uh, we need to put in uh, as kind of developers of the system, we need to then know kind of what is the problems with this data we have potentially collected. And the problem is that that actually in general, um, we, we have uh, less knowledge about what uh, data is, is personally uh, uh, identifiable. Uh, we also have limited knowledge on kind of how can you combine different data streams with machine learning to recover the, the identities of people and also how can you co uh, combine data. So what we have done there is um, if you collect some data, uh, uh, we have these semantic descriptions of data as kind of the outset and uh, what we do there is that we have developed a concept where you model what data you collect uh, or process in your system. And then uh, for each data type, we have uh, built a knowledge graph that represents how uh, potentially that data can be attacked. And this means that you that if you model what data you collect, this uh, tool that we have built can tell you what are the potential privacy risks uh, by collecting this data. And this means that by such tools, you can actually estimate what is the privacy risk of processing this data in your system. And then you can start to make informed choices of what elements of the system uh, to protect. So this is uh, what I wanted uh, to share with us, uh, with you today about uh, some of the different projects uh, we're doing in um, at SDU at the Mask Institute, uh, main, uh, here uh, from the software engineering section, but a lot, as you can hear, a lot of this is also in collaboration with the SDU Robotics. And we do, uh, as you can see, a lot of different kind of projects uh, with uh, industry, open source industry, and, and also European projects. Uh, we publish in a lot of uh, relevant values and then is part of uh, a lot of different uh, networks, both in Denmark and internationally. So 
uh, thank you for attending this talk. Uh, you can read more about our research here, and um, then we would be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mikkel. Uh, Diana, the live stream is stopped.